Assessment is the engine that drives learning. Feedback is the lubricating oil that keeps the engine moving. And if we want to do one thing that will improve students' engagement and success, that is to spend more time and energy on feedback. We also need to see how across a, a course or a program, assessments align with one another, whether we are in fact assessing summatively too many times or not enough, whether we're making um, log jams, traffic jams for students in terms of having too many assignments <coughs> at the same time, because we know if students are under stress, and are doing too many assignments at the same time, that's when they A, get ill, and they cheat, and they plagiarize, and they underperform against their own capacities. Who in the room knows that to be true from your own students? Wave at me. Quite a few. So we don't want there to be log jams. We want to assess authentically because if I want to assess whether you are able to ride a unicycle, a bicycle with one wheel, do I ask you to write a history of the unicycle? Do I ask you to write a set of instructions on how to mount a unicycle? Or do I ask you to list all the parts that comprise a unicycle? Or do I ask you to unicycle? Now, that's a metaphor, but I want you to think about some of the tasks you give your students to do in assessment and say, am I assessing authentically or am I using proxies like writing about rather than to see whether they actually can do? I would like a doctor who can treat me well rather than one who can write about treating me well. I would like an airline pilot to fly me home safely rather than one who can describe in full detail every element that makes up an aeroplane, and indeed write and draw me diagrams of how aeroplane flight occurs. I would rather he can do, but informed by the scholarship of the training he's taken beforehand. So it's that combination of understanding and knowledge. And are our processes fair and sensible? Because the former pro-rector says, if they're not fair and they're not sensible, students will behave badly and there will be lots of complaints and we cannot hold up our heads in the university community. And if we do all these things, assessment can continue to improve student learning, making what we call, it's a punning term, a marked improvement. It makes for a better assessment. Okay? There's a lot to take on board there. That's the end, and you'll see that again in about an hour. But before we do, looking at that list there, again, talk to somebody and say, el más importante de es, off there, okay? A few minutes, what's the most important thing? Again, I'll interrupt you, you'll get fed up with this, but the main thing is, Everything I've learned about talking to audiences is, if you want to keep the students engaged, you don't just go through PowerPoints line by line in a monotonous voice. You must bring the students with you. So here's your moment. One thing from that list that for you is very important. One minute, go. <laughs>
Nobody was asleep, so that's good. <laughs> Before I leave the end, which as I say, you'll see at 10 past 11, can I just walk you through... Oh, that's what... Oh, no, let's go back to that one. Because, importantly, if you want these slides, they're all there. Phyllis put them up already for me. And if you want to take the slides, use them with your colleagues, use them with your students, do anything you want, everything Phil and I do, everything Phil and I have done for about three years, are on our websites, open access, use as you think fit. Everything goes up there. You can use them, you can plagiarize them. We don't care, do we? <laughs> because, of course, as we recognize when we're working with our students, the PowerPoint presentation isn't the session. So that's where they all are. And if you're interested, here are some references that you can look at later if you want to, including uh, Matt York's Leaving Early on Retention, Roy Sadler, whose work on um, formative assessment is the best in the world, uh, a certain esteemed professor at the top of that page, um, David Nicholl and McFarlane Dick on formative assessment, a uh, project from Bradford in England, the PASS project, which is looking at not just how you assess in a single module, but how you assess over a whole program. Um, you'll also see um, the work of Jude Cowell and Jeanette Ryan on teaching international students, the work of Graham Gibbs, and a project I worked on this year on the bottom of that slide called A Marked Improvement. This is a project that I worked on with other UK experts on through our UK Higher Education Academy, and that's very helpful. And also, um, some other work, particularly um, the work of John Biggs on constructive alignment, and the work of David Bowd, whose work on self-assessment is second to none. Okay. So we can all nod off now, because I think really we've got the conclusions, we've got the references, and if we are very strategic students, you could go and have a cup of tea now. But please don't. <laughs> Let's go back to close to the beginning of my presentation. And here we see uh, from this booklet here, uh, point eight, El docente de utiliza la evaluación como insumo para aprender Evaluar a sus estudiantes durante el proceso y los resultados alcanzados de manera concordante con los aprendizajes esperados y el trabajo realizado. Realiza de modo frecuente y oportuna una retroalimentación de los logros y aspectos por mejorar a sus estudiantes como complemento a la calificación y utilizar criterios claros y conocidos para evaluar. It's all there, isn't it? That is the essence of what we're talking about. And please excuse my awful Spanish, I've only been learning two years. But I'm working hard at it, and I've learned much while I'm in Chile, but possibly not great pronunciation. So, it's getting there. It's good. It's harder when you're older. So assessment isn't just the end of the process. Earlier I talked about the importance of formative and summative assessment. Formative assessment, the main purpose of formative assessment is to shape and to change and to inform. Formative assessment includes lots of words and it's usually incremental over a period of time. Summative assessment is endpoint. Its main purpose is summing up or judging, and it usually contains numbers. And of course, there are hybrids between the two. But assessment isn't just the summative judging. It means that learning can happen, <coughs> so that students can understand how theory integrates with practice, they can make sense of what they've learned, make sense of it, not just learn it, not just repeat it, but understand it. And it takes a meaning beyond memorized content. Have improved epistemological frameworks, by which I mean 
They can make sense of how things link together and how meanings link together. So they can see how components of a program fit together and they can learn through the activities they're required to undertake with assignments. Now let's just think about the assignments you give your students. Some people think I'm very against multiple choice questions. I'm not against multiple choice questions. I just want them to be useful. So if you use multiple choice questions, you need the student, when they're going through the program, to get immediate feedback. I think multiple choice questions are useful if they tell the students not just what they got right or wrong, but why it's right or wrong. And the most useful multiple choice questions give students the possibility of individualized pathways. So that if you get an answer right, then it can move on to the next level of questions. If the answer is wrong, it goes to a parallel level of question, and eventually all students get to the same place. Those international programs in problem-based learning, in Maastricht and um, Arborg University, very often will use in medicine such a broad, personalized approach. So that it isn't just a matter that students aren't getting right wrong. The real thing that students need to know is why right wrong. Yes? And with exams, an exam is fine as an end of a program assignment because it has no feedback function in real reality. But an, assign an exam needs to contain questions that do not just permit a student to read the PowerPoints, read the books, and simply regurgitate, bring back the work that they've learned already. There must be some processing. It must pass through the student's brain. It must engage them. It must involve learning beyond memorization. So I'm interested in activities that help students genuinely to learn and aren't just end point. And so this is what I want us to do, going back to your point. I want this to be assessment for learning, evaluation, how can we use appropriate and fit for purpose methods that is sure that assessment does the job we want it to do, that is, it's fit for purpose, and is integrated with student learning, and maximize student achievement, you get some of the very best students in Chile, in your, in your university. And I'm always interested in added value. Your students come in with high grades. Many of them go out with good grades. What about the students who come in less good grades? Do they go out with the same? In which case, you've added a lot of value. What about if they come in with good grades and they come out with a poor grade? Have you damaged them? What did you do to them? <laughs> right? I'm very interested in that progression, that travel. And I think that what we need to do is look at how we can make sure that we're always maximizing student achievement. And when we talk about feedback, sometimes very good students say, huh, you gave him lots of comments, and you gave me two words which is very good, it's fine, yeah, but where do you go next? And how can the best students get even better? Now that's hard, because if you look at the comments, I have looked at the comments, that students write, have written on their work, five times as many are negative than positive. Well, that's, that's probably how we do it when we're prioritizing our time, but yes, let's think about how we can make sure that even the good students are getting better. So maximize their achievement. But at the same time, we want to assure standards. We don't want anybody to graduate from this university who doesn't meet the standards that we would expect. And the kinds of things I say to people when you're designing a curriculum and looking to what you're going to assess, if you went and visited another university, what kinds of things would you be shocked and horrified if the students could not do, right? So what kinds of things would you expect of another good university 
it, whether it's in biomechanics or whether it's philosophy, what kinds of things would you find profoundly shocking that those students could not do? And they would then be in your curriculum, and those were the things that you would have to seek to find ways to effectively assess. This is a silent exercise. 30 seconds, close your eyes. Think about, in your subject, what you would be shocked if a student graduating couldn't do. 30 seconds or less. Close your eyes and think. students to be completely quiet and turned in on themselves, but it is interesting. And then your next question for yourself is, in your subject area, in your degree programs, do you actually assess those things and do you assess them well? Right? Now we're going to have a smugness test. How happy are you about your program? If you think you are very good at assessing those central things that you've just been thinking about, Please raise two up in a minute. If you're in a minute, in a minute. If you think you're quite good, raise one arm. And if you think you've got a long way to go, raise no arms at all. Now, before you do anything, close your eyes again. <laughs> and when your eyes are closed, vote two arms. I'm very good. One arm, we're quite good. No arms at all. We've got a long way to go. Keep your eyes closed, please. Everybody vote now. Arms down. I have to tell you, colleagues, there were an awful lot of people who either didn't obey the instruction or aren't very happy. Is that right? So there were a few two hands, a lot of one hand, and really quite a lot of no hands at all. Which, as I say, means either you're asleep, I don't think so, <laughs> or you're not too happy. So we want to make sure that we want that our students are getting the best from assessment and that we are focusing assessment on what's necessary. So throughout this session, we're going to be thinking about a holistic approach to assessment, not just, I'm going to talk about what's in my bit, and you're going to talk about what's in your bit. But instead of it being like Switzerland, lots of separate little independent or, or organizations within a single nation, we're going to try and go for something more like the Netherlands, where it works as a nation all together. OK, and I'm going to ask you five questions to think about to ensure that assessment works effectively. Now, I didn't make up these five questions, but Peter Knight and I, back in a book in the 90s, which is in the reference list, were, we believe, in English, in England, the first people to use these five questions in relation to higher education assessment. And they're very easy questions to ask, and not so easy to answer. And the five questions are, why are you assessing? Secondly, what is it you are actually assessing? And then, how are you assessing? And who is best placed to assess? And when do you assess? OK, another small task now. And you again talk to somebody else, or just have a think. But I would like you to come up with five reasons why you assess students, OK? You can talk, you can think, you can look out the window if you can see one. No, you can't do that. <laughs> again, it's a very short test, short exercise. Why do we assess? So question one, why do we assess? Go, think, talk, whatever.
That's one of Phil's favourite sounds. Glasses clinking together, Phil really likes it. Okay, so here are some reasons why you might want to assess. And if this was one of your reasons, you may wave, you may go, yeah, or you may remain silent and nod politely, okay? So one of the reasons why we might want to assess is to assure standards, to make qualifications meaningful. It's essential to assure and enhance standards of student achievement, benchmarking them against appropriately against one sector. Anybody got that one? Yeah, wow, yeah? <laughs> But there's often a tension between widening participation and assuring standards. We've always got to think about how we are going to make sure that all students can get there and that everybody has a fair chance. And we <coughs> need to make sure that if we, for example, as we often do in England, which is a very bad thing, we will admit students whose English isn't quite good enough to come on our courses because many of our programmes have financial requirements to fill their programs, yes? And then we let them sink or swim. I say we've got to make sure that if we do take a chance on students, we can't just leave them on their own and have to support them. And it's simply not good enough to take students, take their money off them, and then leave them to sink or swim. Assessment of student learning is a fundamental function of higher education. It's the means by which we assure and express academic standards and has a vital impact on student behaviour, staff time, university reputations, league tables, and most of all, and here I speak as a parent, on students' future lives. Our National Student Survey, which is a horrid thing that's being adopted worldwide, we got it from the Australians, we got it badly wrong, the Irish and the Germans are following us, they're getting badly wrong. Don't go for a National Student Survey in, in Chile, it's a bad idea. So our National Student Survey has, however, made obvious to researchers what we've known for many years, that assessment in universities is not by any means perfect. So. Assessment for learning, the debate on standards, needs to focus on how high standards of learning can be achieved through assessment. This requires a greater assessment on assessment for learning than assessment just of learning. We need to move beyond systems focused on marks and grades towards valid assessment of the achievement. Those things you've thought about, that you'd be shocked. Valid achievement of the intended program outcomes, as John Biggs would argue. I'm just gonna pop back. So, if we, I want to go back to, I'm gonna just put buffer blank. If you're wondering how I'm moving between slides, if you put the slide number in and enter, it takes you to that slide. And if you put buff, it takes you to blank. Okay? You probably don't know this or do know this already. Okay, let's go through some of those reasons for assessing. Why do you assess? Somebody call out. You don't know why you assess. That's, really, that's worrying, isn't it? But you're not alone, sir. Why do we assess? Yeah, don't worry about the mic, I'll repeat it. To improve learning. Because if, if students know what they're getting wrong, they can get better. Why else do we assess? Doctors, why do we assess doctors? Yeah, we need to know their skill, we know to know their safe, we know to know their fit for practice. Why else do we assess? Yeah, so we can see progress, ipsative development, added value to see how they develop. Yes, why else? Yes, please. Also, that is an opportunity to know how I'm teaching. Yeah. Very good, because if all the students do badly, they may all be stupid students, but it might be my fault. So there's many, many reasons why we assess. And so the implication of that is if we are assessing at the beginning of the first year of the first semester, the way we assess is going to be very different 
from where we assess at the end of the final year. Because at the beginning, we are building confidence. At the end, we're checking whether they're fit to practice. And so <coughs> the implication is that we're going to be doing it in different ways. I worked on an electrical and mechanical engineering degree at one stage as teaching communications. And we assessed the students on day two with a very difficult maths exam. Can you guess what the results were? We lost 10% of the students in the first week. Now that might be what you want to do. I would say, please do it before they arrive. So, yeah? If, if we want to use uh, that kind of assessment method, it belongs, I think, at the end. So we need to remember there's a whole range of reasons why we might want to assess students. Work. But. So, we think that assessment can improve learning if it's done right. It's largely dependent on professional judgment, and confidence in judgment requires us to talk to one another, to establish appropriate forums for the development of sharing the standards within and between professional communities. Assessment shapes what students study, when they study, how much they study, and what approach they take to learning. So if we want students to cut and paste from the internet, if we want students to work just on the surface, if we want students to memorize without learning, we'll tell them that by the forms of assessment we use. <coughs> so what we need to do is use forms of assessment that are appropriate for the reason we're doing it, yes? So the people who write about strategic students say, students regard marks like money. How much time should I spend? How much is this worth? Yes? So if we show them that it's worth very little, because we give very few marks to it, they'll do very little. And if we show them that everything they do throughout the whole course is completely unimportant, because the only thing they do is have to sit in the exam, sensible students will say, I'd rather go to the beach. I can read the textbook. I won't bother going to classes. So assessment shapes students' behavior. And so assessment design is really important in determining the quality and amount of teaching that we do with students. And if we wish to improve student learning, we need to make sure that assessment is our starting point. OK, so on to my next slide. Here's one for the vice rectors. A good assessment can save money. When assessment is really part of the formative program, there's a better chance that more students pass first time. And I know in Chile, I've been reading in your papers, you have interesting discussions about how long it takes to get an undergraduate degree. You'll be interested to know that in Britain, if we can't get students through an undergraduate degree in three years, there are heavy financial penalties for the university. So we regard three years as the standard. We expect a master's degree to be completed in 15 months, and a PhD with a student being taught full time takes three years. You may think that's ridiculously short, but actually, the whole of Europe lines up behind that under the Bologna regulation, and more and more nations outside Europe, including Australia, are doing the same thing. Now, I'm not an agent of the government. I am not trying to ruin and destroy your Chilean excellent education system. But sometimes, keeping students on target for shorter, more focused periods of time can be helpful. Maybe our three years is too short, but certainly the German 10 years it used to take to get an undergraduate degree is too long. Somewhere, uh, some uh, private universities in Britain, which we've just started having, say you can get an undergraduate degree in two years. Well, it depends. Maybe they can. It depends what they've done before they come, because more and more students are not coming straight from school. So. We want less resets, less repeats, less appeal, less complaints, less dropouts, 
And if we get the assessment right, that is an inevitable corollary. That's a result. That is not just me saying that. That's a result of a significant amount of research literature. And in order to get students to succeed, we need them to understand a whole range of competencies. They need to develop these competencies. I and a number of other people describe these as literacy. The ability to write is the first literacy. And the ability to read. And reading itself, do you know I could do a whole hour on reading itself and how reading has changed in the last 10 years. It really has. Think about how you read and how that's changed. And think about how an 18-year-old reads. Attention spans, reading on screen, reading on tiny screens, yeah? Reading has changed. So we need to have academic literacy, understanding how higher education works, understanding what kinds of things they need to do to be a successful student. They need information literacy. They need to understand that looking at something on somebody's website can be a very, very dangerous way to find information. Okay? Wikipedia, is it accurate? Mostly. But when it's wrong, it's really, really wrong. And what's the difference between my website and an uh, international peer-reviewed e-journal? The difference is peer review. The difference is, Fed and I can put any old rubbish we like on our websites, but to get into an electronic journal, at least three people, two reviewers and the editor, have to think it's sensible. So students shouldn't trust just anything. Students should be using Google Scholar rather than Google, even if they did just that. So they were led to scholarly material, that would make a difference. Assessment literacy. If students understand how assessment works, if they understand concepts like criteria, and weighting, how much is the exam worth compared to the course test in between, if the exam is 100% or the course test, are, those kinds of things, if they understand the rules of the game, and if they understand what is and what is not allowed, if you're off sick or if you're ill, compensation we term that, whatever they need to do, they need to know how assessment works in universities. They also and we know this at heart, and you know it from your experience of group work, they need to develop social literacy, that is, the ability to work in a group with whoever. And if this six group of people contain nice people, which it does, and horrid people, which it may, I don't know, and if this six group of people are assigned a task to do, it doesn't really matter whether they like each other or not, they've got to get on with the job. And that whole ability to actually damp down your emotions and feelings and actually work collaboratively and collectively to a communal aim, accepting the principle of collective responsibility. If we all agree, it's no good you going off and doing something else. Everybody's got to work together. That's what I mean by social literacy. And using what, again, in the jargon term, is emotional intelligence, that is the ability, on occasions, to put the good of the group ahead of your own personal preferences. Yeah? So there are some literacies. I think not only do students need, but we need to be integrating into student learning experiences. Yeah? So those are some of the things we really need to be embodied in our teaching. And if we're keen to get students to succeed, we need to track and monitor students who are likely to fail. And we can support them by having well-systemized approaches that effectively and efficiently use technologies. For example, using early computer-based assessed tasks so we know within the first six weeks, through those personalized pathways, who the students are who might need extra help with maths or stats or writing. We know that relatively early on and we can do something about it. It isn't just a matter of finding the students with problems. It's actually directing students into activities that will help them develop. And if we provide them with learning pathways that depend on the students' marks, 
in the last interaction, those pathways will lead students to higher achievement. Now, it's difficult with big groups to keep a personal touch. It is difficult. Um, if you've got 600 or 800 students, that's very hard work. I said that deliberately because in my conversations in this university, somebody said, oh, we have very big groups, 60 students. And I said, mm. in some places I work, I work with a colleague who teaches in Egypt and her lectures are a thousand. And she assesses a thousand a son. Not a bundle of laughs. Not correct, sorry about that. I try not to go into cliches uh, and vernacular. But it's not much fun teaching a thousand students, but it's achievable. In your large classes, how can you maintain some kind of level of personalized communication? Well, yes, you can learn names in the classroom, but you can also look at the way technologies can help you support this. And Magdalena and her team have many, many things they can help you do with this. So here are my fit for purpose questions we return to again. The whole we've been talking about there is why we might assess. The next one I want to talk about is what is it we're actually assessing. Um, so purposes might include enabling students to get the measure of their achievement, helping them to consolidate the learning, providing feedback so they can improve and remedy deficiencies, motivating them and providing them with opportunities to relate theory and practice, helping them make sensible decisions about options and alternatives for further study, demonstrate employability, provide assurance that they're fit to practice, give feedback to teachers on their effectiveness, that was your point, and statistics for internal agencies. What about what we assess? The orientation. What is it we're going to assess? Are we going to assess product or process? In the lab, is it the result they get, or is it how they got there? In your group work, you've produced an absolutely marvellous artefact. It might be an engineering drawing, it might be a poster for a scientific conference, it could be a presentation. Okay? I'm interested in your product. I'm also interested in your social literacy. Did you work as a team? Did you argue? Did everybody turn up, excuse me, Ian? Did this man come so rarely that the other five of you got very fed up and he just swanned in at the end and got the same marks as everybody? Is that fair? Lady in check thinks it isn't. And did this lady, excuse me, again, did this lady spend so much time telling everybody what they had to do that nobody else got a fair chance? Because I'm interested not in just in the product of their group work, I'm interested in the process. Now, how am I going to check up on their process? Well, I'll tell you how not to do it, and it's what I used to do, all right? I used to go around and watch my students working, and I'd have a clipboard, and I'd have all their names on it, and every time they did something, I would tick, and if they did something particularly good, then or I'd cross the tick, and the basic I was looking for was two tick crossed ticks per person. Then I'd go to another group. This group, having behaved beautifully while I was there, are at each other's throats now. Yeah? So actually, me trying to observe what they're going to do is impossible for all the groups, particularly if I've got 120 engineering students. So how am I going to know? Well, I could insist everything they do is videoed, and then I'll check it all up afterwards. That's one way, a bit time consuming. Every hour of video takes me an hour to watch, yeah? Or how about when they finish their process, I said, okay, you five are going to use some simple criteria to assess Ian, and then you five are going to use the same criteria to assess Phil, and so on. So everybody takes part in peer assessment, and it's inter-peer assessment because it, sorry, it's intra-peer assessment. It's within that group. The other groups might be involved in assessing the artifact, and that would be inter-peer assessment, but within the group, it's intra-peer group assessment, okay? And I would like to, so I want to assess product. Are we assessing theory or practice, particularly in HE? I would argue medicine, engineering, <coughs> Aviation science, we want both, don't we? Theory and practice. 
Is it subject knowledge skills? Is it um, your physics or your biology or the way you use it? Are we assessing what we've always assessed or are we assessing what it's easy to assess? <coughs> and sometimes we assess what's easy to assess as a proxy, like the unicycling. So I think we need to be focusing on what it is we're assessing. Next question. Now, again, this is a task for you, just in case anybody was getting tired or dropping off. Okay. In international higher education, three forms of assessment are used for something like 80% of assessment. Okay, it's three methods. I'm going to ask you for some methods beyond the first three, but first, what are those first three? Widely used in higher education. Written essays. written essays of some kind, okay? Unseen, time-constrained exams, that's where you sit in an exam room and you don't know the answer, and some kind of report. 80%, and the one that's more dominant in the US is multiple choice or computer-based. Yes, what was your vision? Presentations is actually a small part. In some countries, oral assessment, like it is here, is very high. Internationally, it's a very small proportion. Uh, in the Netherlands and in Scandinavia, there's an awful lot of oral presentation, but internationally, 80% uses exams, unseen time sorry, unseen time constraint exams, essays and reports of some kind. That's the main way. Okay, you've already mentioned a couple more, which is presentations, and I've mentioned multi-choice tests. Now, in the book I wrote with Peter Knight, we came up with 84 methods of assessment. So what I want you to do, guess what? Talk about methods other than the ones I've covered. What methods can you use to assess students? Off you go. Ooh, a whole minute this time. Go. <laughs> you're teaching it, yes? 
So by putting on an exhibition or a display or producing a pack for school children on your speciality, that assignment actually teaches students a huge amount. <coughs> Next one, portfolios. Plain portfolios or e-portfolios? Who uses portfolios? And what do you love about portfolios? <laughs> what do you love about portfolios? <laughs> right, so you can look across a whole range of a student's achievement and compare that over a period of time. So it's not like an exam, it's not a snapshot, it's a continuous process. And you can specify the learning outcomes and you can see whether the students have matched assessment against learning outcomes. Because the two pillars on which we build assessment are the criteria and the evidence. In this group, when we're looking at whether you work together, were the criteria able to take turns, do information retrieval, and the evidence from their group work comes from not them just saying Magdalena saying, I'm great, but Magdalena can show me on the log that you've kept, or the diary, what she's done and when, okay? Criteria and evidence. And that's why portfolios are great, and why are portfolios awful? Why are Oh, they take such a long time to assess. And particularly if you use e-portfolios, where students are giving you loads and loads of evidence, and they now include websites and videos and audio tapes. So when I assess portfolios for teacher education, for higher education teachers, I used to say, let's make our portfolios extensive, but let's mark the reflective commentary, yes? So you don't read every word, you don't look at everything, you look at the evidence, and in the commentary students say, look at this, look at that, so you can check, but you don't read every word. So projects, vivas are what we in English call orals. Viva voce in Latin, okay? Orals. Assessed seminars, posters like you'd have at a scientific conference, yeah? And some do and some don't. Presentations, individual presentations, group presentations. And all the issues we talked about, about this naughty six applied to group presentations. Ian might have never helped with any of the presentation, but he might be the main speaker. And we have to be careful about that, because I think Ian might be eloquent, and we might be tempted to give him the highest mark. But it might have been Leonor, who's done all the work but she might not have had a chance because Ian spoke too much. Sorry, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> How about an annotated bibliography? This is a very good exercise for early students. Instead of saying, write me an essay on social and medical uh, aspects of practice in uh, the work of a clinical psychologist, you might say instead, go away and find three journal articles, two books, five websites, print me out, or send me electronically, not only what you found, but how you found it, and why you think it's useful. And then we can discuss that in a lecture, and we can look at, for example, you sent me a link to a website, which is basically one of the top websites in psychology. Well done. Whereas, I'm sorry, you sent me a website which is basically some idiot in California. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's very interesting and we might like to do a psychological survey of him. But it's not, I'm sorry, it can't match this one. And yes, this book is good, but there's a more recent one. The more recent edition is even better. So you use it as an assessment task. There are marks associated with it. But it's at the same time helping students learn. Um, Blogs, diaries, reflective journals, and critical incident accounts. So a, lo a log might be a list of 174 things the student needs to do in industry. And a diary, can we here use reflective diaries? Yes? And they're lovely because they get access to the student's emotional intelligence and social literacy but they sometimes make you cry, yes? <laughs> so an example I would give is a colleague who was teaching um, student nurses who were learning geriatric care, and the diary the woman wrote was about doing this as a job, 
but at home she's nursing her mother through the final stages of cancer. It was covered in tears when she handed it in, and it was covered in more tears when she got it back, yes? So instead, that teacher said, I'm going to make it easier for me and the students, because they took a long while to write. She said, I'm going to ask them to find, over the course of 12 weeks, three moments, three critical instances. And using a pro forma, on which they were only allowed to write 200 words per area, they wrote, what was the context? What did you do? Why did you do it? And where was the scholarly literature from your degree that you used it? What was the outcome? What would you do differently next time? And what was your learning from it? So that's six times 200 words, 1,200 words, Actually, it gets closer to the learning outcomes than a long, teary diary. And yet, the student keeps the diary, but the diary acts as the source, the reflective, um, the reflective account, the critical incident account, is only 1,200 words to mark. Uh, productions of various kinds, case studies, field studies, dissertations and theses, and some more. Um, a different approaches to exams, open book exams, where the students aren't demonstrating what they've memorized because the book is there. Takeaway papers, simulations which might be live or they might be computer-based. Case studies, OSCEs, Objective Structured Clinical Examinations, where, for example, medical students or events management students go to different places in a room and do a different task that lasts five minutes. Here I'm going to take a history from a patient. Here I'm going to take um, some blood and look at it under the microscope. Here I'm going to look at some data. And they do multiple separate things used in lots of disciplines. Short answer questions. Intra exercise is my favorite because they are models of real life. The student goes into the exam and they're given a dossier of papers. They don't know what the papers are about, and they don't know what the question is. They read the papers. It's like what you do when you come into work in the morning and you read your inbox. Yes? So the student, and then, for example, it might be for a ward manager in a hospital. Here are all the patient records, the drug records, etc., etc. OK, can you prioritize from this what are the three most important tasks you must do in the first hour? Okay, and then halfway through the exam, you get new information that says there's been a road traffic accident. What are you going to prioritize now? Okay, so it's checking that a ward manager can't just write about being a ward manager, she can actually or he can actually do it. The technique came originally from accountancy, where the dossier contained financial papers and they were asked maybe to draw up a trial balance, and then later on they were asked to think about. Um, what would happen if this company went out of business, or whatever, right? So in train exercises, live assignments, the best example I came was law students who were asked to follow a real court case, and half the students were working on one side and half worked on the other, and they did all their research so effectively that the real life protagonists came to the students to ask for their thoughts. That was very good. So it's a very authentic assessment. Has pragmatic problems if the case is adjourned, but the teacher had that in mind. So live assignments, uh, computer-based assessment, and again, if we had another hour, which we don't, I could talk for an hour about how I used to hate computer-based assessment, and now I'm a passionate aficionado because I've seen how computer-based assessment can use a whole range of questions that don't just ask you to pick one answer from four, or if they do, they want you in the next question to say why you chose that answer, but also use things like uh, mark a point on a, ma on a graph where something happens, or they ask you to look at a geological map and answer the multiple choice below on core samples from the geological map or whatever. They might ask you to drag and drop elements into make a diagram. They might ask you to label by typing into certain points on a diagram or whatever. So much more complex and demanding than traditional computer-based assessment. As you can tell, I could talk for ages about this. 
What I want you to do, 30 seconds, eyes shut or open, just think about those ideas and say, is there anything about those ideas that you would like to think about some more? Okay, 30 seconds, eyes shut, go. with a space for comments beside it, which is a very common form of assessment using a pro forma. Why not give the students the pro forma to fill in when they hand it in? So they're making a judgment about their logical and fluent argumentation, their use of references. So if they say they're good and you think they're bad, time for conversation. If they think they're bad and you think they're bad, they know they've got to do something. Yeah? Okay? And who else can? Well, employers can. The nurses, practice tutors can. Line managers in employability context can. And also, if we want to test whether a lawyer is good at taking a history from a client, we can stand and watch with a clipboard. We can ask a fellow student to watch with a clipboard. We can ask the solicitor who's working alongside the professional to take an assessment, or we can actually say to the person in concern, were you treated with respect? Did the person asking the questions actually get to the core of your problems? Was there anything important they missed? So a whole range of people can assess. And of course, if we go back to my first question, why are we assessing? And then we link it to what are we assessing? And what methods? And then who assesses? You can see it's quite a complex interlocking framework, but actually we come to a really fit for purpose approach to assessment. So that takes us to our last question, and the last question is really easy. When do we assess if you want high levels of mental ill health, high levels of student failure, and high levels of dropout? Leave everything to the end. In English, we call it sudden death, summit of Okay? So we don't want that to be the case. So we don't want summit of muerte. I would always argue, argue, particularly in the early years of a program, that students need lots of incremental assessment. Having said that, if you want high failures on PhDs and MAs, then don't give them any help or give assessment or feedback right till the very end. We want to not assess when students have finished learning. We want them to be assessed when there's still time for improvement. 
often we'll assess when it's convenient for our, assess, our systems. So we always assess at the end, because that's how we've always done it. And we've always done it because it's right, and it's right because we've always done it, yes? There is no logic in that. And we also need to, as I said at the beginning, look at managing assessment so there aren't log jams, so that the students aren't faced with six assignments in week seven. This happens in Britain. Is it week seven with you? The week seven of the semester, everybody sets an assignment. We call it week seven blues in Britain. Okay, so we're now coming close to where we want to be. So I want to go to just look at some work that's been done um, in the UK, but with wider um, reference. <laughs> Assessment for learning. We'll just look at the purple ones. I love purple. The task should be challenging and expect students to give more than just basic stuff. The learning assessment should be integrated. That is built in. It's not separate. Shouldn't just come at the end of the learning process. Students need to be involved in being able to make judgments about the quality of the work they're doing <coughs> while they're actually doing it. Yes? This is Roy Sadler's words on this. Roy Sadler says if we want students to be good, they need to be able to see good examples of work and make judgments while they're actually doing it so that they don't crumb crying to you saying, I don't know why I got a bad mark. They should know why they got a bad mark. Are you with me? We need students to be able to judge their own performance and we need to encourage thinking about thinking, metacognition, promoting thinking about not just what I'm learning but how I'm learning. Uh, Noel M. Russell's research shows very clearly that students who are engaged in thinking about how they learn, not just what they learn, actually are more successful in many, many nations. We know that assessment should have this formative function, and the term I like, which doesn't translate, is feed forward. That is to say, not just correcciones on what I've done in the past, but ideas for next assignment on how you can improve in the future. A highly successful strategy. There needs to be an opportunity for students to practice and get things wrong before they go for the final assessment. So a safe learning environment. And there should be, very important, opportunities for dialogue between students and their assessors. Now that's hard if you've got 600 students or even 120. But what I always used to say to students was, I, to staff working with me, let's try and make sure that the dialogue isn't just between me and one person, but as far as possible, it's shared through the virtual learning environment. So if you send me a question, I'll answer it, but I'll say to you, I'm going to put this on the website so we can all share it and other students can join in. So it needs to be dialogic. It shouldn't be just me, the great leader, telling you what you've done wrong, because you're very bad students. That doesn't help anybody learn. I have never, ever learned anything by being told I'm awful. It just makes me behave worse. I think I'm not alone. Phil would agree, but Phil has a whole separate book and workshop on that. <laughs> I think we also need to think about how we can tell the students what to expect, make assessment visible. The tasks should not be able to be done with a tiny part of the student's mind and brain and personality. It has to engage the students and helps them not just to be receivers, <coughs> passive recipients, but also actively engaged. I've talked about authenticity. We need the tasks they do to be authentic, relevant, and allowing students to take some control over their work. Because if they think you're just putting them through the motions, they will treat it as a non-serious activity. And if they think that you are using the same old questions year on year, they will actually behave as if the assessment is important. We need to make sure the tasks are fit for purpose. And as you've indicated, we need to find out whether our teaching is good through our assessment. So, colleagues, have oh, we got time for one more slide? Please. 
When we're talking about computer-based assessment, we need to be able to think about assessing that is about helping them learn. So formative assessment is the most powerful thing that students can use computer-based assessment for. And if you think making computer-based assessment is very time-consuming, you are right. If you think it's easy, you are wrong. <laughs> Students really like the chance to find out how they're doing and like to be able to test several times as part of a learning process. And if we want to see how a whole cohort is doing, computer assessment can be helping us keep up track of a big cohort of students. People use computer-based assessment to see in a cohort of 600 or 800 students which 20 really need active interventions. And so, again, in the early part of the program, it can be very helpful. And of course, computer-based support isn't just text-based. A colleague of mine did a great project which is called Sounds Good. Google, it's Google Scholar, Google sounds good, and you'll find his work where he experimented with giving colleagues in a whole range of disciplines activities where they were giving feedback to students by speaking into an MP3 player and sending the students the file as a sound file rather than a written file. What he found was that students would read written feedback between zero and two times, yes? because lots of students don't read written feedback, they're only interested in the number. But the students would listen to audio feedback between one and 17 times. They had to listen to it because the mark didn't come till the end of the three minutes. Yeah? But lots of students were listening to it lots and lots and lots of times to hear from that how it was doing. So I think we can use a range of computer-based assessment, not just traditionally, but in very interesting ways. Colleagues, as you'll be aware, as is always my case, there are more slides than you're going to see today, but now is the point you've been waiting for. Brace yourself. Yes! <laughs> And I'm also hoping not only for questions, preguntas, but also I want comments and statements. And I'll be taking them through the intercession of my dear friend, Magdalena, who is going to take written questions from you and who is going to help me understand because my deficient Spanish might lose the nuances. So I'll catch my breath and you'll be handing your questions to Magdalena and we'll go from there. Thank you.